Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'd like to make a start, and if I could start by, first of all, welcoming all of you to this uh, very important event uh, to launch um, this new uh, WHO uh, report. Um, I know that we have people here from all over the country and also from other European countries, and I just wanted to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to London. Um, also, on, the, on behalf of the Department of Health in England, I'd like to welcome this report, to welcome particularly its evidence-based approach and its recommendations, because health inequalities is an issue that we've taken seriously for many years in England and in the UK. We were amongst the first and the strongest supporters of the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, closing the gap in a generation in 2008. And taking into account um, its conclusions, we commissioned our own English review into health inequalities, uh, the Marmot Review, um, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, in 2010. But this new review looks across the whole of the WHO European region, um, builds on this work, adding new dimensions and identifying new evidence-based conclusions about what really works in policy terms. And it underlines the stubborn and persistent nature of health inequalities across the whole European region at a very timely moment. Health inequalities have persisted and in many cases have widened um, despite overall improvements in life expectancy and reductions in infant mortality across most member states in recent years. And at the same time, um, they've been exacerbated by a very difficult economic situation that challenges not only the most vulnerable members of society, but pretty much everybody, in a way that is reflected in risks to uh, living standards, to educational opportunities, to uh, job prospects, job security, as well as health and well-being. And that's why this report is really important. It reinforces the message that people's health is shaped by the conditions in which people are born, in which they grow, live, work and age, the social determinants of health and that action must be directed to addressing these social determinants. We've sought to pick up this challenge in England and are looking to improve health outcomes for all, reducing the rates of avoidable premature mortality and achieve national health uh, uh, outcomes that compare with the very best in Europe. But this means addressing health inequalities. Unless we reduce health inequalities, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to improve overall national health outcomes. It means tackling these, these inequalities through the social determinants and right across the life course, as advocated in this new review. Um, measuring and monitoring progress is also very important if we are to sustain momentum, and we will monitor progress on the duties um, imposed on um, Secretary of State and the NHS uh, with regard to health inequalities, and on health outcomes, including through the Public Health Outcomes Framework. This review adds to the growing volume of evidence that already exists and gives it a unique appeal right across the European region. It offers member states a prompt to action through its recommendations and learning about what really works. I hope this review will encourage member states to work cross-government to reduce health inequalities and improve health outcomes in the same way that the English Review on Health Inequalities encouraged us. By taking a lead from this report, Member state governments can enhance the current and future health and well-being of their peoples, help them fulfil their potential and improve their wider prospects, and break the cycle of inequality, disability and poverty that scars too many families and communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, David Walker for um, welcoming us all and for your um, opening remarks. I'm Zainab Badawi. Good morning to all of you. I'm going to be, um, you'll be sick of the sight of me by the end of today because I'm going to be with you for the whole afternoon and we're going to be thrashing out um, some of the key issues in this uh, very, very landmark report which you all should have picked up a copy of. Um, when I came in, I was very struck by these tables and um, one of the organisers said that this is what's known as the new kind of informal cabaret style. And I thought, you know, often people say to me, you look like Diana Ross, and I, I, but I can tell you I can't sing like her, so don't get carried away with that cabaret idea, will you? Anyway, we have um, 
a whole host of really, really, um, you know, specialists in this field bringing their own perspectives on this very, very important topic of the social determinants of health. And it's a topic I've followed for several years now, and I'm, I'm delighted that uh, it's gaining traction both in the media and also at policy level. But there is much, much more to uh, be done in this regard. And I hope by the end of today, we would have put some of the uh, flesh on the bones of how we can actually galvanize all the actors um, in the public domain to um, try and work to the same end. So the person who commissioned this review as part of the new thinking in Europe um, on well-being and health is uh, Susanna Jakab, who is WHO's regional director for Europe, 53 member states, and um, based in Copenhagen. And I apologize in advance for her because she has got a plane to catch to go back to Copenhagen. We started a little bit late, so it may be that Susanna may have to um, go before we finish. But Susanna Jakab, please Please come to the lectern, don't let me hog it, and uh, give us your um, introductory remarks, um, setting the scene for us on this review. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say that it's a particular pleasure for me to be here today, because this is a great day for us, and this is really a celebration that we can jointly with all of you on the panel and all of you in this room can launch the new European study on social determinants and health and health divide in the European region. And let me briefly explain to you why it is so important for us. As we all know very well, health is a precious global good, which is much higher on the political and social agenda, both in the countries and also internationally in recent years. And it is very clear to everybody that health is an important part of development. It is also clear that in recent years we have a changing health landscape. The global health architecture has become more, more extensive and very complex in recent years, also due to the fact that health has become such a big priority. It is also clear that both globally, but also regionally, health has improved significantly, particularly in our region, but yet deep inequities and inequalities remain. It is also clear that the health challenges that you can see on the slide have become multifaceted, and they require the active involvement of all levels of government, both internationally, nationally, and also locally. In spite of these great improvements in the European region, and let me emphasize once again that when I say great improvement, what I mean is that we gained five years in life expectancy over a period of 30 years, which is a tremendous success in the European region, but our region is scarred with inequities in health. And let me just quote a few figures, which you will find also in the Michael Marmot study. There is a 17 years difference in life expectancy among the males. There is a 12 years difference among the females. There is a 40 time difference for a woman to die in a childbirth if she is born in a country which is not doing well. And a 40, 45 times difference in maternal and infant mortality in the WHO European region. And when I say WHO European region, I mean 53 countries. Because for us, this region also includes the former Soviet Union countries, Southeast Europe, and all the northern countries. And of course, these inequities in health are unacceptable. They are unjust and unfair, and we have to act on them. And we also realize that if we want health to be part of the development, and if we want to further improve the economy of our countries, we definitely have to act on them. But it is not only inequities between the countries that worry us, but there are also inequities within the countries. Even in the most developed countries of our region, you can find nine, 10 years difference in life expectancy, and that is huge. Looking at the burden and the general trends of premature mortality in the European region in the last 35 years, you will see again that health has improved, but there is a great burden of disease from three leading causes of premature mortality, which are the heart disease, cancer, injuries, and violence. 
and not less than 77% of the disease burden in the WHO European region are caused by NCDs, the chronic non-communicable diseases, and investing in prevention and better control of this group of disorders will reduce premature mortality and preventable mortality and morbidity and disability and improve the quality of life and well-being of people and help reduce the growing health inequalities in our societies. So these are just a few facts to illustrate to you why I initiated this study. And I initiated this study when I was nominated from my, for my present job, but I was still in my previous job as director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And I looked at the European data and I, said the great, I saw the great progress made in Europe. But at the same time, I also said that these inequities in health, they are unacceptable, unfair, and we have to act on this. So this was the time when I approached Michael Marmot and asked him, what can we do about this? Can we come up with a set of recommendations, policy recommendations, that we can build into the health policies? Are the European countries ready for it? And we also discussed with Michael that we have, until now, we had the diagnosis and a lot of evidence, but what we need now are the policy recommendations for actions which we integrate into the health policies. And Michael said, yes, of course, let's work on this. And this is the result of this great work, and I'm very happy with this. But at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, I also realized that it is not enough to have studies. And you will see in your pack that we also worked on other evidence like the economics of prevention and the results are coming out now. But these policy recommendations have to be integrated into the health policies. And this is why I started another process to develop and update the European health policy and to make sure that we have a participatory process in Europe with all the 53 member states to come to an agreement on the st key strategic objectives and the main priorities of the European policy. And I'm very happy to tell you that this European policy framework was adopted in full consensus with our 53 member states last year in our regional committee in Malta, and this is now also ready for implementation. What is the European Health 2020 policy about? It has two key strategic objectives. One of them is to work to improve health for all and reducing the health divide in our region as one of the key strategic objectives. But in order to do so, and in order to act on all the recommendations that come, up, come, uh, come out from the Michael Marmot study, we have to improve leadership and participatory governance for health and move more towards a whole of government approach. And you can see the four interlinked priorities and also this policy is underpinned by, by values. This is a policy framework that is adaptable to the various realities of the countries, which is very important because if you look at the magnitude of policy recommendations that come out of the Michael Marmot study, you will realize that they will have to be analyzed in the context of every single country to decide which are the ones that the countries are ready to take on. Health 2020 wants to reach higher and wants to reach border, and there was a long development journey to introduce uh, this policy and have it adopted. And I would like to emphasize also that we worked on many areas to produce new evidence that informs Health 2020. This one was the key and the most important area that we are launching today. But at the same time, we also reviewed the governance implications of this, and there are two studies that we have already uh, launched during the regional committee last year. And currently, we are also working on finalizing one of the most important studies that underpins Health 2020, and this is how we can make the economic case for prevention, health promotion, and public health. And this is a joint study that we are doing together with the OECD and the European Observatory. Of course, these two are very much interlinked, and um, through the Health 2020 implementation, we will make sure that key policy recommendations are taken forward. 
And finally, let me quote our Director General, who put a very nice foreword into the Health 2020 policy when we took it to the Regional Committee. She said that we want to see better health and well-being for all as an equal human right. Money does not buy better health. Good policies that promote equity have a better chance. We must tackle the root causes of ill health and inequities through a social determinant approach that engage the whole of government and the whole of society. Thank you very much for this attention, and these are the words with which I would like to pass on the floor to the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sana Jakob, thank you very much indeed um, for uh, making that keynote speech there. And um, this morning we have just a couple of keynote speeches and then we have a panel who are also going to be making their introductory remarks. And we started a bit late, but we hope that we will be able to take some comments uh, before lunch from the floor. Um, our next keynote speaker is um, somebody who really in this field needs very little introduction, but I will nevertheless say, Sir Michael Marmot, who's director of the Institute of Health Equity at UCL, University College London. And no exaggeration to say that Michael is a, a pioneer in this field of social determinants of health. He um, was in charge of this review in the European um, uh, Regional Office for WHO. And um, Michael, you're going to make some presentation, a presentation for us now on the policy challenges, bringing your considerable expertise, commitment, and passion to this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Sainab. And when we greeted each other this morning, we said, we're really going to do this because Zainab was the moderator of the event in Rio de Janeiro, the first world conference on social determinants of health. And she said, this is getting traction. This is getting traction. And I'm really excited that it is. You're going to get me in three bits today for better or for worse. The first is to lay out the challenges. The second will be to talk about the themes of the review. And the third bit will be to talk about the recommendations. In between, three of our task group chairs will talk about the work that they did. And to say that in bringing this evidence together, we had task groups consisting of the best scholars across Europe and, in some cases, beyond Europe's borders, synthesizing the evidence on what we can do to make a difference. So let me just introduce the challenge. And the first is to say that the rest of the world considers Europe to be the rich region of the world. The other regions are the, think of themselves as the ones with problems. But we have huge problems within Europe, persisting inequities in health between countries and within countries. So if we look first at the health divide in male life expectancy, a 17-year gap between Russia and Israel, Iceland, just behind them, Sweden, um, at the other end. For women, the gap is 12 years. Commonly, we see that social inequalities in health have impact on both genders, but the differences are commonly bigger in men than women, and we see this across Europe. Now, when you think about a 17-year gap in male life expectancy, it means that in Russia, life expectancy for men of 63 is the same as for men in India. In India, a third of the population live on a dollar 25 a day. The new definition of poverty. That's not the case in Russia. The poverty levels are much, much lower than that. And in fact, the causes of death in Russia that carry people off are not malaria. Primarily not tuberculosis, not diarrheal disease. The biggest single contribution to the disadvantage in Russian mortality is cardiovascular disease, heart disease, then violent deaths and other alcohol-associated deaths. So powerful 
is the operation of the social determinants of health, that we can get this 17-year gap in life expectancy without it being the toll of communicable diseases, primarily non-communicable disease and external causes of death. That's the between country differences. So can countries at the top end of this scale relax? No, not really. Here's Sweden. I showed you right at the top end of the life expectancy gap. This plots life expectancy for men, it'd be similar figures for women, by education. The bottom graph is life expectancy for men in Sweden with primary, the lower level of education, then the next level, and thirdly, university and beyond. You can see the social gradient. The lower the level of education, the lower the life expectancy. Over time, very welcome improvement for all groups, but the improvement has been slightly more rapid for those with more education. So there's been an increase of the gap by one year over this relatively short period of time. So even in Sweden, they have persisting and even growing health inequities. And at the other end of that life expectancy scale, Russia. This is the expectation of life of 20-year-olds to live to 65. For people with university education, that was increasing over time. For people with the primary level of education, that expectation of a 20-year-old living to 65 has been decreasing. So the gap is getting bigger. The social gradient is getting steeper. All countries in the European region, the healthiest, the least healthy, and everyone in between has this problem of a social gradient in health, of health inequalities within countries. And in many cases, they have been increasing. We still have poverty in the region. Here, countries are classified by the um, annual gross national income at purchasing power parities and looking at life expectancy by GDP. And what you see, I think, really are two clusters. Look first at the richer countries. From about $20,000 national income at purchasing power parity, there's really no relation between income and life expectancy. Now, that's very important because one of the questions that keeps getting asked in the context of the global financial crisis is, well, if we're poor and it's going to be difficult for us to get rich, is there anything we can do? Once you get above about $20,000 of purchasing power parities, national income, getting richer isn't associated with better health. As Margaret Chan said, quoted by Susanna a moment ago, it's not just money, it's social policies and programs that make a difference. Now look at the poorer group. There's a huge cluster, in general, for poor countries, having more money is a good thing because they can spend on various social programs, but it's not a very tight relationship. Now, ideally, if you probably can't read it. If you look at a country like the Czech Republic or Slovenia, they're making the transition from the poorer group to the richer group. So getting richer in general is a good thing once you, to get you into the richer group, but once you're in there, increases, further increases in national income are not the issue. I would argue that we do know what the issues are and they're in our report follow those and health will improve and health inequalities will narrow. Because we say these health inequities are unnecessary, they're avoidable and they are unjust. And this continues in the tradition and David Walker introduced it this morning 
of the Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which we published in 2008, which we called Closing the Gap in a Generation. And we said, the reason for taking action on avoidable inequalities in health is one of social justice. Unusually, for a WHO report, on the cover, we said, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. And that we had to put empowerment at the center of everything we were trying to achieve. To achieve. Material conditions empower people psychosocial, having control of your life, and political, having voice. When people ask me, both with the WHO report and the English Review, and now with the European Review, where's personal responsibility in all this? Don't people have to look after themselves? And my response is personal responsibility is right at the center. But we have to create the conditions that enable people to take control of their lives. Taking control of your life is a good deal easier if you're not born into poverty, if you have good early child development, if you have an education, if you have a job, if you have enough money to live on, if you live in a safe neighborhood, if you have good health services when you need them. So we need to create the conditions for people to take control of their lives. If I can make a personal observation, we did a press conference this morning, and after the press conference, separately, two journalists came up to me. One said, I was expecting a sort of dry as dust collection of statistics, and what I got was a ringing cry to take action. And the second one said, I've been following you for some years, and you're becoming more forthright. Where's that coming from? And I said, it's coming from the evidence. It's coming from the evidence. The nature of the challenge before us, and the fact that the evidence shows us we can make a difference. And we should be doing it because it's a matter of social justice. And we emphasized in this report more than we did. We got chided a little bit with the WHO Commission that we didn't say enough about health as a human right. We put that right at the center of this report. And as you'll hear through the day, our cry is, if you're in a poor country, doing very little, do something. I'm looking at Ali Lundberg. I'm grateful for this mantra. If you're in a country that's doing more to address social determinants of health, do more. And if you're up there in the Nordic countries and you're doing a great deal, do it better. We can all make a difference. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. And uh, before we come to our panel, I just wanted to ask you very quickly, Susanna Jakob, why is WHO so keen to ensure that health is a human right? What difference does that make? Well, I mean, this is one of the important fundamental rights of every human being to have access to health and good health. And uh, I mean, uh, this is also a very key uh, important feature of every development of every society. And I, I think the two have to go hand in hand. And uh, in my view, health as a human right has always been the basic uh, um, assumption of all the WHO constitutions, policies, and all this. And uh, this continues to be uh, the, one of the values and value basis of our policies. Uh, I think that. Uh, it's somehow it's given in WHO that health has to be a human right, and we had lots of discussions about this, but we never uh, had any intention to move away from this basic uh, assumption. And, and Michael, uh, you know, given somebody like you, who really, as I said, has, has been working in this for such a long time, right from when you were a young GP working in Australia, and um, was struck by the fact that you had patients, you know, representing themselves for the same ailments and 
conditions all the time, which made you think about how do you address the cause of the causes of the illnesses. Why did it not occur to you that this would be a good way of encapsulating what you've been working on, putting it in the realm of human rights? Initially, I thought that human rights was jobs for lawyers. And I didn't think lawyers needed my help in having more jobs. So my slight reluctance to go down that route was, I really thought it was jobs for lawyers. And the sainted Mary Robinson took me aside and explained to me very patiently, um, this was not about jobs for lawyers, that this was very consistent with everything that I'd been pushing. And it was a combination of two great teachers, Mary Robinson and Amartya Sen. So Mary Robinson explained to me it was not about jobs for lawyers. And this, this is was, when she was the United Nations Human well, it Rights was, Commissioner. And she she's had, a lawyer also, but anyway. Well, yeah. she's a lawyer, yeah. she president, former president of Ireland, former UN Commissioner on Human Rights. She'd stopped being the UN Commissioner by that time, but nevertheless, she was fundamentally committed to it. And Amartya Sen talks about freedoms he wrote, I think probably his best-selling book was Development as Freedom. And he said that rights embody important freedoms, that it's only worthwhile calling something a right if it, if, it, if it has two things, two characteristics. The first is it embodies a freedom that we think is important. And that spoke to me, because I talk about having control over your life, being empowered. And that's a freedom that's worthwhile emphasizing. People being empowered to have control over their lives, creating the conditions. And the second, said Amartya Sen, is if it's, influ if it's possible to influence it by social action. So that's me. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm Thank talking you. about. Thank you. I'd like to invite to the stage Bill Gunyan to take his place. David, I think you're uh, moving on to your next appointment. Bill, if you could sit here, please. So our next panelist is um, Ruth Hussey, who is um, uh, head of uh, uh, NHS um, Wales. Sorry, I'll start again. Our next uh, panel member is the Chief Medical Officer of um, Wales, Ruth Hussey. And Ruth, if you, if you go to the lectern, please, and perhaps tell us how you're applying the principles of the review in your country, um, 1.3 million people, and... Uh, you're, you're very, very keen to ensure that health inequity is very much at the heart of policy in your, in your area. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I think today's a fantastic opportunity to reflect and to digest the powerful evidence that uh, uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot has produced along with the team of people. Um, and uh, it's been a, a strong influence for many years now. What I want to talk about is um, how Wales is embracing that, a population of 3.1 million people with its own uh, government. And um, uh, some things have influenced both my interest and I think many others in, in the importance of why we need to do something about the evidence that we hear. The first thing that's important is the understanding, um, making sure people really um, get behind the evidence and absorb what it means. I was influenced, before I went to Wales a year ago, I was influenced by um, uh, a councillor in one of the uh, towns or in, uh, in the north of England where I worked and um, he listened to this evidence and he sat back in his chair and he just, he, he looked despairing and he said, um, well it's the whole of society. And he was overwhelmed by the power of the evidence. And I think the next job for us uh, is to really turn it, and I know today we will, we will spend some time looking at so how do you actually make something happen? Take the evidence and the understanding that was profound uh, into, so what can we do? I think politicians need the, the evidence, but also, so what can we do about it? And, and uh, I think those are two themes that are, are critically important. The other thing that I think uh, is, is critical is, um, the sense of urgency to act on this agenda. Um, I have a, a sort of story that I keep with me at all times. It goes back to a, an event like this in a, in a city hall in a, in a town, I, a city I worked in, again in the north of England. And we were presenting something we were very proud of, myself and the local government. Uh, we, we launched our city health plan. 
and uh, it's very much based on the Healthy Cities movement at the time. We were incredibly proud. We'd, we'd got the sense that at last we'd linked poverty and social context with health, and that was a, a new thing. We're going back nearly 20 years. And um, a gentleman stood up in the audience and, and he said, how long is all this going to take then? And uh, we did the usual thing, you know, well, this is a long-term agenda, um, this is a 20-year plan, and, you know, things will take time. And he just simply said to us, I probably don't have 20 years. For me, it's now. And I've, that's never left me. Um, that sense of it, this is people's lives we're talking about. And so um, I've, I've been in Wales a year, and um, what I've discovered is that um, tackling inequalities is at the heart of government in Wales. And um, uh, I want to share with you just very briefly um, words from a speech the First Minister made at a public health conference that we had uh, about 10 days ago. Um, we were lucky to have the Regents for Health for, across Europe uh, in the audience. And, um, and this is what they heard him say. Um, As First Minister, I have responsibility for a whole range of policies and programmes. Let me assure you, nothing ranks higher on my priorities than the health of the nation. Poor health is bad for individuals, bad for communities, and bad for prosperity. I don't need to describe to this audience the social determinants of health, um, but I can give a sense of what our approach is. What I'd like to emphasize is that we aim to link policies across all departments. And for example, um, we have a future generations bill, which is, is um, grown out of the work on sustainable development, but it aims to look at the environment, quality of life, and life chances, and health is, a, is part of that thinking. Uh, we have other bills, social services and well-being, um, all trying to codify uh, the need to uh, redress that inequality. Um, so where are we uh, in terms of uh, life expectancy? Well, it's increasing. Um, healthy life expectancy for men and women now is 63 years on average, and um, yet our inequalities do persist. Um, the uh, approach is very much about delivering programs of change. Uh, we have a program targeting the first few years in life called Flying Start, really trying to address the disadvantage of children in the poorest communities. We have Communities First, again, targeted programs of work supporting communities. Um, and uh, this year, uh, a cross-government tackling poverty action plan where every government department must uh, account for what action it's taking to address uh, poverty in, in Wales. Um, and then, again, in development, we have um, people will be very familiar with the inverse care law. Uh, Julian Tudor Hart, a Welsh GP, described it nearly 40 years ago. And again, we've worked in train now to say, can we really, really put that into practice? Can the NHS do what it can do best uh, to redress that balance too. So trying a number of programmes, trying to take the, the policy context uh, very much into practice. The shift needed from illness to wellness. And um, uh, my recent uh, Chief Medical Officer report talked about uh, very much the principles in Health 2020, whole of government, whole of society, action needed to improve the health of our population. So of three words to capture, I think, the agenda ahead of us. Uh, those three words, people, place, and power. And we have programs addressing the life chances and opportunities for people. Um, we have legislation that addresses uh, the opportunity of place, the environment we're in. Uh, for example, recently had active travel legislation, creating the opportunity for walking and cycling to have um, uh, a focus in plans of local communities. But thirdly, and I think very importantly, power. Um, what can we do to make it uh, a true partnership? And uh, one of the themes that, that's emerging in our thinking is the concept of co-production. Um, this will be work that we take forward over the next 12 months, focused on creating an equal partnership with the people we serve. So I think I'll have a chance later this afternoon to develop some of those themes, but um, uh, hopefully give you a flavour of the determination uh, and the, um, uh, if you like, focus that we have on trying to take the powerful evidence that exists and try and turn it into practice. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Did I misspeak when I gave Wales its population, Ruth? Yes. Did I? I think I got my numbers. I, I was never, adding up was never my strong point. Sorry, 3.1 million. I think I may have said 1.3 million. 
Um, thank you very much indeed for your comments, Ruth. Um, and Ruth, you mentioned in your presentation how you know, somebody said to you, look, can't wait for 20 years. This has to be done now and so on. And I want to ask Susanna before uh, she has to depart. You know, part of your report, it says closing the gap in a generation. Is that really feasible? Well, I would say that there is an urgency on this, and I fully agree with Ruth that we have to act now, and we cannot wait for another generation. That was, of course, the global report that Michael Marmot has produced, and in the region with these recommendations, which are clearly pointing into the ways what actions we need, we can move on, and we have to move on. And the present austerity situation is one more reason why we have to act quickly. Uh, one of the statements in Michael's report says that austerity is a reason for action and not for inaction. And I fully agree with him. We have been following the impact of the economic and financial crisis in, on health and health systems in the last five years, and we came to the same conclusions. And. Um, I think and I feel from the discussions we had with the ministers and with the, with the government is that the region is ready for this. And even in austerity situations and even in low-income countries, governments do have a choice. If they move towards the right policies, adopt the right policies, they do have a choice and they can make progress. Of course, as I said, no country will implement all the recommendations at the same time, but we have to move forward and we have to make a prioritized plan. And the final message I would like to give is that WHO is fully committed to take action on this through the Health 2020 on one hand, but also through the uh, several discussions that we are planning across the European region to discuss these recommendations with the policymakers across the sectors. And of course, we have to move ahead with the whole of government approach, because if we are to implement this, we have to reach out to the other sectors, because many of these issues are not the responsibilities of the health sector, yet the health ministers have a very vital responsibility to advocate for these issues. And WHO is fully behind this. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed, Susanna Jakob. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, we wish you well you. and uh, with your organisation. Thank you. And my invite to the floor uh, to represent the WHO, Dr. Agis Suros, who um, is uh, Director of the Division of Policy and Governance for Health and Wellbeing. Susanna, thank you. So, okay, our next uh, panel member is going to make some brief comments, but he's also got a PowerPoint, is um, the Swedish perspective, a country always um, feet like Sweden features um, in, in these kind of discussions and, and trying to see whether you're getting it right in a country which, of course, is famed for um, its uh, social and welfare policies. Denny Vagero, is that okay? Vagera, Vagero. I've been practicing my Swedish all morning. It's Professor of Medical Sociology at the Centre for Health Equity Studies in Stockholm. He was a commissioner in this WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health during the 0508 period, and he's a member of the Senior Advisory Board that guided this review. And you're going to talk to us, and in particular, about a study that's been carried out in Malmo, um, which, of course, uh, I think, as most people know, has got a very high level of immigrant community in Malmo, being on, on, on the water and so on, and we... Look forward to listening to what you have to say. Thank you. Yes, uh, Malmö is a city, as most of you know, in the south of Sweden. It's suffering under heavy external influences on its development, global, European, and then, of course, local internal developments. Uh, when you talk about health inequalities, it's important to understand how these play out. Um, there is a commission for a socially sustainable Malmö. It worked from 2011 to 2013. It came about because the deputy mayor of Malmö, Katrin jammer Schanfeld, read Closing the Gap. She went to the local parliament and got clearance to appoint a local commission of politically independent commission of academics high-ranking civil servants in Malmö and other experts. They've been working for, for two and a half years. The aim was to promote health equity and to promote social sustainability. The concern was that Malmö is not, the development in Malmö are not sustainable. 
there's lots of social divisions, ethnic divisions, and uh, problems of poverty. The Malmö Commission worked parallel with the WHO European Review Group. We had a joint meeting in Malmö in January two years ago. One of the questions, or the main question we discussed was, what can a local government do? That is there anything left for a local government to do to promote health equity and social sustainability? And of course, there is lots. Malmö is strongly pressured by global and regional developments, and this is just some examples. It's one of the fastest growing cities in Europe. The migration is uh, quite strong. Uh, it, half the population is transient. They move in, and after some years, they move out. The other half is more permanent. There's a large influx of refugees. A special problem of concern is children coming without parents seeking asylum. It's been about 100 such cases every month the last few years. There's segregation, residential, ethnic, and social. There's also some strong points in Malmö's development. They got a strong social, uh, uh, civil networks, they got a strong cultural scene, and they got a strong local government, which is quite important because this local government has been actually pushing this uh, development of a commission. Can the local government cope with global influences? Some, the report from this commission, from the Malmö Commission, talks about that and spells it out more in detail. I can only give some examples here. Segregation, for instance. Urban planning is one tool to, to deal with segregation. We had the city architect in our team. He was a man of great visions and wanted to do a lot of changes. We have uh, shaped two grand projects, so-called grand projects, uh, to change Malmö, the cityscape of Malmö. Uh, one of them involves getting uh, renovation of old buildings, old housing stock, um, by using local labor, unemployed young people with building skills, and local business, small businesses, so that it has an impact both on housing and on labor market. Child poverty in Malmö is highest in Sweden. Uh, the key to do something about that is to find employment for men and women with l a large number of children. And that, that's, that's one of the things that have been identified. Other, there are other tools as well which are described in the report, which I won't get into here. Labor markets is another area where local government can do something. Local government in Sweden is a big employer. Taxes in Sweden basically go to local government, not to state government. Most of the taxes we pay go to local government. They have an independent status vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government. They do employ people. Uh, and they do have an imp uh, impact on labor market. Of course, it's, mar it's not marginal, it's quite big, but it's not total. The, lo the government in the country has a bigger impact. But local government can do something. Malmö has created something called a social investment fund to, uh, for people to get grants to do things that they can argue is going to be pay off in the long run in terms of social outcomes. Schools is a, a further area. Schooling is uh, under the local government control uh, in Sweden. Most of the schools are local government. Nowadays we have a lot of private schools as well, but it's still the, school, the local government has got the final say. So that's a big area. Uh, so there's a long section about school policies, preschool policies. I won't address that here because it takes too much time, but. I'm just going to mention that here, and this is some of the areas where there are programs and suggestions. I will mention one experiment that's been done, the so-called Brankeflu school experiment. It's a randomized study which was done some years ago and it's been reported to us, uh, where one hour of physical exercise the first two years, organized by voluntary contributions from sport clubs in Malmö, has led to uh, outcomes five years later, improved physical, mental uh, health, and improved school results for those kids that were actually given that option. And it's quite a strong study, it's only one study, but it's, uh, it's something that shows what can be done on a very simple level. 
The recommendations of the Malmö Commission is firstly a massive local government uh, investment in social infrastructure. Um, and the social investment fund is one of the funds. Malmö, of course, had a massive investment in physical structure before this, uh, with the bridge to Copenhagen, with a new railway in infrastructure and new buildings. But now it's the social infrastructure that is in focus. And secondly, new ways of working uh, together with academics, civil society, to actually find out what's happening uh, is also another part of the program. The report is published uh, half a year ago. It's now being translated into English. Uh, it has triggered a local government activity, quite a massive local government activity. Lots of local governments have been uh, triggered into action by this. And so it almost looks like we have a social movement in social determinants of health. Thank you. Fascinating there about how Malmo is really uh, very much um, putting words into action. But just a, a quick word on your social investment fund. I think it's only about 100 million Swedish kroners, about 10 million pounds, which doesn't sound like an awful amount of money to achieve everything you want to do. But how is your social investment fund going to be funded? Uh, it's a small sum of money. Now, relatively small. If you think 10 million pounds is a small sum of money, it is a small sum of money. It's a start. Local uh, regulations of local government, or state regulations of local government, doesn't allow them to, f to build up funds. But they can use surplus from previous year's budget to fund. And that's what's been done. So it's going to be a long-term effort to build up a very strong funds. And then you can think about other ways. For instance, if the government changes uh, uh, national laws to build, build up these funds. Thank you. Thank it's you only one of the things they, they're thinking about. Thank you. If we have time before lunch, I would like to ask you, uh, Dr. Agis, ab about what WHO is doing to, to help people at local government level. But I, I will just introduce our uh, final panel speaker this morning, um, Bill Gunyan. He's Chief Medical Advisor and Director for Health and Wellbeing at the Department for Work and Pensions. So, uh, Bill, if you give us a perspective now from uh, central government. Zainab, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, conscious of time, I just want to share uh, some thoughts. My interest clearly uh, has been, from my own department's point of view, around one of uh, the key determinants of health that Michael uh, has highlighted for many years, namely uh, that of employment and the impact that that has. And uh, we've spent uh, the past few years uh, in this country looking at how we can change the perceptions of the relationship between uh, work and health, uh, and therefore looking at it from the point of view of not just another government department, not a health department, but indeed how we can bring together a number of different uh, government departments and stakeholders to try and get a recognition of the importance of work uh, to health and to uh, health inequities. I thought I'd share just some thoughts, first of all, on, on what I've learned uh, about uh, how to do that over, over those years. And I think one of the key things has been to have a long-term vision of where we wanted to get to around that particular agenda, uh, but identifying along the way uh, short-term uh, objectives, which fitted very much with uh, political priorities at the time, and those obviously evolve and change uh, along the way. Clearly, it's very important to be able to demonstrate what the benefits are now in this area for uh, my own department. It was about showing uh, the impact that uh, focusing on health has on uh, people's capability to work, to stay in work, to get back to work, but also actually demonstrating the benefit that uh, work has uh, to health uh, and uh, the impact that that has. And one of the interesting things is that uh, when we looked at, in, in one piece of research we did, uh, at those who flowed when they developed health conditions out of work and onto uh, state benefits, uh, it, uh, it's clear that in that group there is disproportionate representation from those who are in low-skilled, low-paid jobs where the likelihood is that the, great, the, the greatest health uh, inequities exist, so we actually then compound the problem. 
I think demonstrating that there is evidence to support our case and uh, over time we had uh, commissioned some reviews of, of the scientific and related evidence that supported uh, the links between uh, health and work. And one of the things that was particularly important was uh, external stakeholder engagement. And in the case of the health and work agenda, it's not just been engaging health professionals, although that has in itself not been without its challenges, but engaging employers, engaging trade unions, uh, and engaging uh, individuals themselves. Um, I think one of the, one of the real uh, initial challenges was uh, in trying to change perceptions was the recognition that it isn't just about uh, uh, having uh, work or it isn't just about what happens in work. It's actually important uh, that people have work in the first place. Uh, so the challenges of getting people into work, once they're there, keeping them there, uh, and should they fall out of work, getting them back to work is absolutely critical. It's also important to recognise that on the health side, it's not all just about prevention. I think we often forget that the quality of health-related interventions, uh, including what happens in our, in our hospitals and in, in our primary care practices, the quality of that influences the likelihood uh, that someone will recover to the point where they're able again to work. Uh, and that also includes the quality of rehabilitation that's available. And that's going to become more of a challenge to us uh, as we face uh, an increasingly aging workforce, and that's happening across, uh, across Europe, uh, with an increasing burden of chronic disease, where actually the quality of uh, management of those chronic conditions will seriously influence whether people are able to uh, continue to work uh, or not. So I think a recognition on the healthcare side that uh, employment outcomes are actually an important uh, consideration uh, in any health intervention, uh, both in the uh, therapeutic space and in, in the public health space. I think for me, perhaps uh, the most significant uh, milestone in the journey we've been on in Great Britain, and can I say that one of the interesting challenges in Great Britain is that of course we are effectively within Great Britain, we have uh, three countries where the healthcare uh, systems are increasingly different and that does create some challenges uh, when uh, trying to produce policies that uh, actually link uh, health and work. But I think we've managed it very well and uh, obviously in Wales particularly, uh, Ruth's leadership has been particularly important. Um, We've got to the point where having built up momentum over uh, many years uh, and having tried to develop different policies, we're now at the point where uh, we will next year uh, introduce uh, a health and work service which is designed to provide uh, occupational health advice and assessment for individuals who are in work but who have been off work uh, sick for uh, around four weeks. And this is an attempt to try and provide better quality occupational health advice to uh, general practitioners and other healthcare professionals, uh, to employers and to individuals, in the hope that we can actually reduce the likelihood that people who actually do have a job uh, make that uh, trans transition to long-term absence uh, and job loss. So that for us, I think, is quite an exciting development and one that I hope uh, will in time uh, provide some evidence that perhaps others can use uh, in other countries uh, as they look to, to see how uh, they can uh, help keep people in work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Just very quickly, Bill, before we go to the floor, um, you know, what do you th how do you think you've succeeded or how far do you think you have to go in engaging political attention for this particular agenda? Because, I mean, after all, that's the theme of, of, of this morning's session is the, you know, the policy and political perspective. I think f in terms of what we've achieved, political engagement has been absolutely critical, but I think it has been that ability to identify things that would help achieve the longer term vision that played to particular political agendas at the time. And I think that's been, that's been quite key. I think the other thing is though that the huge amount of external stakeholder engagement we had amongst employers, employer bodies, healthcare professional bodies, developed a momentum which actually also started in its own way to influence the political agenda as well. And I think the two things together have actually been quite important. Do you think there needs to be a kind of specific group, department or 
person or whatever who actually champions this agenda really runs with it or you think it can be a, a multitude of actors? I think in the early stages, I think that, that championing role is quite important, and indeed we did have that uh, here. Uh, Dame Carl Black, who's, who's done uh, quite some, some quite critical work on uh, the health and work uh, agenda, was the National Director for Health and Work, so she had a championing role uh, in the first five years of, of progressing this agenda, and I think that did help, because that, that opened doors which might otherwise have been uh, more difficult to open, and it kept the profile very high, which I think was actually very helpful. I think we're now at a stage where it is becoming much more business as usual, and that was always the objective. Can we get the fact that actually everybody talks now about the links between health and work in a way that uh, seven or eight years ago was definitely not the case? And do you think it's mirrored across other government departments as well, not just work and pensions? I think it has taken more time for that, uh, that buy-in, but I think in, certainly in the past couple of years there has been much more significant engagement in other government departments in the UK around this agenda now, and I think it is now seen as something that is actually quite important. And to be honest, we wouldn't have uh, been able to implement uh, the health and work service that we're looking to implement next year without the support of other government departments, in particular our Treasury Department, who've actually been quite supportive of this. Mm. And Agis, um, from the WHO perspective, and we heard what Denny said about what they're doing in Malmo and you know, how you can't have a kind of one nation fits all kind of approach because Malmo, is, as we heard, has got a very interesting, you know, different demography from other parts of Sweden. But at that local government level, uh, what is WHO doing to encourage, you know, to forward your, your agenda at, at that level? WHO in Europe has uh, uh, a great asset uh, in terms of uh, uh, working relationships with local governments for many years. And uh, it's actually an ideal setting uh, for two reasons. One is that a lot of what we're talking about, the determinants of living and working conditions and supporting lifestyles, all that happens at local level. The second is that Working with other sectors or working with communities is also easier at that level. And the experience with, uh, in Europe with the Healthy Cities Movement that is supported by WHO is in fact that uh, this stumbling block that has been there for all of us, the understanding that health goes beyond the health sector, is much more easily and widely understood locally. And if you come to a meeting, a conference where we have local representatives, like a room like this, you will be surprised today that one third of the participants are urban planners who come there because now they understand that health is important mm -hmm. in their vocabulary and in what they try to do. So I think the, the, the local level is essential in any national strategy uh, that wishes to reach out to engage all those who have a significant role in taking forward the social determinants agenda. Okay, thank you. Just um, three or four minutes quickly uh, to have some comments from the floor, please. There are some roving microphones on what uh, you've heard this morning before we break for lunch. Can I see any hands? And do introduce yourself and say your organisation is relevant because this is going out on the internet. I should have said you, so smile, you are on candid camera. One, and then another microphone here. Yes, please stand and make your comments, thank you. Oh, sorry, no, the chat with the microphone. And then afterwards, you, yeah. Hello, I'm David Kidney from the UK Public Health Register. Um, this is a question about when we all go out of here determined to do something, do more and do better, who will be our allies who will help us to do and who should we watch out for as the enemies who would stop us if they could? OK, thank you. Uh, just pass the microphone to the gentleman in the mauve shirt. Thank you. Uh, Peter Archer, International Federation of Environmental Health. And can I just give a plug for Michael's uh, lecture at the SAGE on uh, Friday evening? It's uh, on Radio 3's website. Uh, it's the start of the free, free Thinking Conference. But that's not what, what I wanted to say. At the International Federation of Environmental Health, we've recently uh, approved a policy which is closing the gap in the generation, and it's the environmental health uh, professionals' contribution globally, of which we've got 60,000 members. 
We've, we've agreed on the why, and, and it's really the how, and we are struggling to prepare an outcomes framework. And one of the problems in Michael's report, he obviously refers to the, uh, the firefighters in Liverpool, and it's really getting out, as we've just heard, into local government, all the people who are involved in inequalities of health moving away beyond, beyond the medical sector. And we really need help in that, in coming up with out, outcomes frameworks. Very recently, Dr. Adrian Phillips, DPH in Birmingham, went on on April the 4th, just when local government had taken over public health, and he said on uh, Midlands Today, the number one public health issue in Birmingham is housing and homelessness. And somehow we've got to get that out mm. and that fully understood by government and local government. Thank you. Thank you. Any other hands? Yep. Gentlemen there at the back in the spectacles. Microphones here. Yeah. Anybody else has got a hand up? And here. Could the microphone also come to this lady here, please? Yeah, far away. Yeah, Councillor Mike Roberts I, I, from the LGA. I thought I'd better respond very quickly. Um, there is a, a disconnect, as Michael Marmont knows, between local government and our taking over and the new role of public health and its relationship to all the other policy areas uh, we deal with. Um, that has to be tackled. And it's not just making a political point, because I come from the red corner and I'm actually working with our shadow team to try and get that message through. Um, but it is a bit of a challenge at this particular point in time. Local government is there for being very positive. A number of my colleagues uh, are actually doing very positive work across the divide at this, this point in time. But, you know, it is a challenge. But as, uh, as colleagues from Malmo have, have, have seen from Denny uh, and his work uh, in, in that area, you know, local government should be the drivers across the policy piece, across the resource allocation, and actually delivering. You know, that is what we need to be doing. And I should be working with our shadow team from this conference actually reinforcing that point. Thank you. We'll take that as a comment. Yes, the lady here, if you um, Sue Atkinson, Public Health. Um, isn't the biggest gap uh, that we need to address the one in income? And hasn't that widened over the recent years? And does that overwhelm all the other actions that uh, are obviously laudable and important, but the socioeconomic ones may be the most dominant and getting worse? Thank you. Microphone ushers, if you could pay attention to people putting their hands up, we can move a bit quicker. There's a lady here in the middle. Thank you. So that two people have a microphone at the same time would be a good idea. Thank you. Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, Dorota Sienkiewicz, European Public Health Alliance, um, Brussels. Um, uh, to, to follow on the question here, not that I want to answer to it on the allies and, and enemies, um, in, in our work on reducing the health gap um, and um, uh, health inequalities, what should be our stand on um, uh, the powerful economic operators that we know that work very hard against our objectives in, in, in our work? every day. Okay, let's combine that then with the first point that was made there. You talk about the powerful economic um, factors that work, conspire against your work and, you, and we had the first point about um, we know who the friends are and who are the enemies. Who on the panel wants to address that particular point first? You, Michael? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, the, firstly, on the economic drivers and Sue's point about widening income inequality. What we know, firstly, is that countries that have wider income inequalities have less social mobility. So the magnitude of income inequality in this generation is affecting the chances of the next generation. And we put a great deal of emphasis on the importance of early child development. That means next generation's chances are being limited. Secondly, I don't think it's only income. If I thought the only issue was income and the distribution of income, we wouldn't have had 12 domains of recommendations in this review. So that it's not just about income. There's a great deal that you can do within the context of the distribution of income that we have. And if I may, just mm. on the allies, exactly as you know well from the Local Government Association, in a way, some of the most enthusiastic uptake for the whole idea of social determinants of health has come 
from local government. Mm -hmm. In England, Jessica tells me that three quarters of local authorities have marmot implementation plants. Denny and I in Sweden, uh, Denny arranged for us to meet government ministers and Denny hosted a meeting in January and a Swedish parliamentarian said, we're still discussing your social determinants report five years later. And I thought privately, it'd be good if you did something. Um, <laughs> but even in Sweden, the real point of traction has been local government, not just Malmo, but now Öster Gotland and Gothenburg and mm -hmm. the Swedish, Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions um, has really got people organized. So our allies are going to be local government, they're going to be civil society, and clearly for the health people here, they're going to be people in other sectors. I think he asked about the enemies, didn't he? <laughs> Not just the allies, who the enemies were. But um, do you want to answer that, or would you, are you too diplomatic well, to do that? For me, um, I, firstly, I'd rather focus on who the allies are than who the enemies are. But, but for me, the enemies are ignorance, the enemies are lack of care, the enemies are uh, rewarding special interests rather than actually having a set of political processes that look at health for the whole population. Um, and for example, to take the first on ignorance, uh, I said to at the press conference this morning that for those of us who are not economists, and actually for those of us who are economists, um, trying to choose between policies of austerity and Keynesian policies to get economic growth, they argue forever. I would say, rather than focus just on GDP growth, Focus on the lives people are able to lead. Look at the likely impact on health and health inequalities. And I would say enemies include those who couldn't okay. care less about the lives people are able to All right. lead. Thank you. Just um, any, yeah, Denny, you want to pick up? You heard of some of the comments there, role of income, how you engage key stakeholders beyond, you know, the health area and, and the allies and the enemies we're just discussing now. Briefly, if you would. I, I just want to say something about the enemies. Uh, and I will, uh, I mentioned three, they're not enemies, but three, there's these discussions between the European Commission, the European uh, Bank and the IMF about austerity packages in Europe. Uh, someone who's pointed to the problem in that discussion is the Red, European Red Cross. For two weeks ago, they took a statement and, and delivered a report. But they say that the discussions that are held between these three are creating massive social and health problems in Europe, and they don't understand it. But the Red Cross has given out a report. That's one allied who pointing to a discussion that we should in, uh, get involved in, the European discussion about austerity packages. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Ruth, some brief closing remarks before lunch, and then Bill afterwards, and then we'll break for lunch. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's absolutely clear uh, the sense of um, evidence, the sense of urgency uh, that we need to do this. But I think what we need to move into is how does this happen? Uh, when Michael was doing the, the report for England, um, I, it, when I uh, worked in the Northwest, we did a, an open space event. There were dozens and dozens, several hundred people who wanted to be part of a conversation part of a, a way of thinking about how do we actually turn this evidence into practice. What came out of it was a very powerful uh, set of proposals, um, themes of who, who does it who should be concerned and involved. And I, th I think that the one I'd say is actually all of us. Uh, and uh, it, it's not too difficult to just set out uh, what each sector has to do, what we need to do differently, whether it's business, uh, whether it's um, public services, uh, whether it's families, neighbourhoods, communities, or whether it's individuals. And uh, that, that work started to set that out in a way that we can all feel uh, we understand not only the why does it matter to me, but what could I do about it? And I think that's the challenge for us now is to move into that so we all recognise that we ha all have a contribution to make. Thank you, Ruth. And I know you're joining us also uh, later on, on our panel uh, discussions, but thank you for now. Uh, uh, Bill, I think this is your, your last chance, Bill, I, to I'm make con comments. I'm conscious it's very dangerous standing between people and their lunch. I think just, just a, a, a final thought building on, on, I think, what Ruth has said and what's come out of some of the discussion is the importance of 
actually working together. And that is easily said and much more difficult to do because it means uh, changing long-held uh, perceptions and beliefs and culture and uh, all those who have an, an interest in this area actually being prepared to approach things with an open mind, uh, not on the basis of trying to protect our own particular areas, but actually looking at what it is together we're trying to achieve and how by working together we can actually do that. Thank you very much indeed, Bill. Thank you very much to Bill, Denny, Ruth uh, for, for the moment. And Michael, of course, um, who's going to be with us later, and Agis uh, for the moment from WHO. It is lunch. We started a bit late, so we'll give you a little bit longer for lunch, but please make it quite prompt if you can be back here by 1.45. We have our um, second session presentations and panel will be looking at the evidence findings and the review recommendations in more detail. But thank you to all our panel.